much. Uh, welcome again to prayer meeting. Uh, just a quick reminder, we don't record the prayers because we want to protect everyone's privacy. Uh, you know, these uh, uh, times go up on the internet, but then when you talk to others, let them know that we begin praying uh, at a quarter till and we continue on until we are finished. That's the primary focus of the meeting. Uh, we just take advantage of that time together to add a prayer focus by going through some concept together. And right now we're going through this, this book, Surviving the Shaking. We're almost at the end of it. I hope that you've been enjoying it. Uh, that tonight we're going to do uh, go into uh, the next chapter, uh, which is chapter eight, the latter rain and the time of trouble. I uh, do want to um, continue to ask you to keep those grieving families in prayer. There are several of them now. And, um, and uh, we'll be with the uh, Lewis family in the morning at 10 a.m. I know the time kind of changed, it's flipped back and forth a couple of times between 10 and 10.30, uh, but that, um, that final viewing time is between 10 and 10.30, and then we will begin the service after that. So keep them uh, in prayer. All right, so uh, chapter eight tonight, the latter rain and the time of trouble. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to, as we always do, look for a variety of people to contribute to the reading, and we're going to have a good time. So let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for what we have experienced together so far. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, you would be in the midst. And so, Lord, we've done that, and we're believing you to bless each and every family represented uh, on the line and in our church uh, tonight. As we open up this book, we pray, Lord, that you open our hearts to receive it. it, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. If you enjoy these things, invite others out to join in with us. Just a reminder that last week we talked about the seal of God. Uh, when we go into, that was chapter seven, when we go into chapter eight, we're not completely abandoning it, we're just going to add some stuff on to it. So we have anybody willing to read for us tonight, just to start it off, you don't have to carry it all the way through, uh, just get us started. You raise your hand there, Mike? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, yeah. Uh, if y'all don't wanna do it, I guess I'll read myself. All right. So here is the introduction. I hope that y'all can hear me okay. Uh, here's the introduction, page 79, paragraph one. Uh, the Bible compares growth in the Christian experience to biological development. We all came into this natural world by passing through water at birth. Likewise, we are born again spiritually as we pass through the water of God's grace. As we comprehend the love and mercy God has toward us, his willingness to forgive and forget all our wrongs, a new spirit, spiritual life is born within us. So uh, I'm sure that all of us are familiar with how Jesus describes being born again to Nicodemus. And so we take that concept to understand how we make it through the time of trouble. There is yet another level, All right? There's yet another level. Last week we talked about the ceiling and tonight we're talking about the latter rain, which is basically strength to get us through. By grace, page 79, paragraph one continue, by grace, we become a new creature in Christ. But just as a baby is completely helpless and requires total care from others, so we must depend on Christ to nurture us spiritually. We're depending on Christ to nurture us spiritually. 
we cannot. You see that? K C A N N O T. Progress. Got it. We cannot generate even a single spiritual thought. Uh, think about that. We cannot generate even a single spiritual thought unless Christ feeds it to our minds through the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a thought. Paragraph two of page 79. As we grow, we learn to do right and shun wrong through the painful process of reaping the harvest of our decisions. Oh, this is so important. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6 and verse 7. In mercy, God allows us to experience both the joy of doing right and the chastisement of doing wrong. Now, this is so important because for some reason, some of us have it in our minds that once we enter into God's grace, we cannot be judged, and there can never be consequences for whatever we do. That is not biblical at all. It's not even Christian in the least bit. And yet, we continue to hear people say that over and over again. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, no matter how much we say it, it's never going to make it true. Just because we're in Christ and under grace, doesn't mean we don't get judged and we don't experience consequences of what we do. It's a part of the growth process. But right behavior is not always a sign of spiritual maturity. Sometimes what seems right on the surface actually stems from selfish motivations. Like a good father, therefore, God seeks to purify our motives. Through the process of time, he leads us to do right things out of pure motives. Love for him and our fellow human beings. I know that was a mouthful, but I'm sure you got it. God even wants to continue to grow us even when we start doing more right than wrong. When we, when we are actually walking and overcoming in our physical behavior, that's not enough. You don't know, we don't always do the right thing for the right reason. God is seeking out our motives as well. And so, uh, so here's a, a moment here for us to, to uh, have a conversation. What we've been describing so far is the sealing process. Uh, any thoughts about the sealing process? Is this important to get this right? Or will we be able to kind of throw it together during the time of trouble and be ready? What do you think about? Do you understand the sealing process? Any questions about it? Any comments about it? Hello. Hello. I was just um, thinking about all the um, dear folk that are leaving us going to the grave until Christ comes back and we hopefully will be able to join them it makes me more and more be extra prayerful and cautious of what I do and say because um, like I said I might can say something that's negative and then my lights go out <laughs> you know so that's the judgment so I just need to be very very cognizant and prayerful thank you thank you, thank you. all right Right. Any anyone else? Well, y'all good. I would like to say, you know, uh, 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 go ahead, Mike, and then Sister Veronica. I would like to say that we do need to have our seals right and not do it wrong. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, you, you have a particular reason for that, Mike, or you just wanted to say that? No, I just wanted to say it because I got to follow it as myself as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I fail at times. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We certainly do. All right. Thank you, sir. Sister Veronica. 
Yeah, I just want to say, you know, <clears throat> this make me have to examine myself each and every day to see if I'm in the will of God. And um, because we don't know what tomorrow holds and um, every day that we live, we have to make it right and we have to live that day as if it's the last day we are living because we have to, you know, let the power of the Holy Spirit work in us to, to get rid of the things that we need to get rid of out of our lives. Because as we said, it's a sanctification process. And um, we just want to be sealed. You know, we don't know when our time is going to end on this earth. So each day, I'm just saying, as we walk, we should examine ourselves before the Lord and see, you know, what we're doing right or wrong and try to, to live that life that's in case tomorrow we don't make it, you know, um, we, I, I don't want to say we'll be sealed because only God knows. <laughs> well, well, sister, uh, he's guaranteed it. You know, that, that's why I keep saying these uncomfortable things because I don't want our people to deceive themselves. You know, there's a mainstream Christianity that says you create your own plan of salvation. There's nowhere in the Bible. Yes, we are all unique, and God reaches us in unique ways. But there is only one plan of salvation. That's confession, conviction, confession, and surrender. That's, that's the only one. Conviction, confession, and surrender. That's what leads us to be sealed in Christ. This picture that we have in front of us, this the priesthood comes to the Levites after Aaron actually leads them into sin. You know, he, he feels pressure to build that golden calf. He's conflicted about it. But nonetheless, he goes along with it. Moses comes down and throws the tablets and God judges and people die. And right after that, God chooses a people to be set apart, beginning with Aaron and his sons. That's why I chose this picture, because before then, before this golden calf situation, I'm quite sure the people saw Aaron differently, and he probably saw himself differently. God has chosen Aaron to be a participant in these miracles that took place in these 10 plagues in Egypt. He chose him to be alongside Moses as a spokesperson and again, a participant in miraculous things. And yet, when there is a waiting period, he stumbles. And God says, after that, you are a chosen people and a royal priesthood. So I wanna take you back to something because see, where people take these kind of conversations as, condemning and the standards are too high, it's pharisaical. No, if you receive them in the way that God is giving them, it's quite liberating. I wanna take you back to this slide. We cannot generate even a single, you see that word single? We cannot generate even a single spiritual thought unless Christ feeds it to our minds through the Holy Spirit. Why in the world would people forfeit that and say, well, I'll just do how I feel? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I ought to be able to do it my way. I don't see anything wrong with what the Bible saying is wrong because, hey, we all, why would I like it if it was wrong? These are the kind of things that grown adults say to me in reference to things we should have overcome years ago. We're not talking about real big things. We're talking about little things. And that tells me that something went wrong in the sealing process. Something happened somewhere between justification and sanctification that's making our folks believe that you can create your own brand of Christianity. Brothers and sisters, that's nothing more than playing God. That's all that is. And in the end, the worst words in the world that anybody could hear is that I never knew you. Okay, so, so we don't want that. We don't want that. 
You see in the next slide, it says, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6, 7. We don't want that. So God allows us to span a time where we can stumble and trip, but he does never, he never intends for us to fall. He intends for us to learn from the stumbling and tripping and change our course. And he said, well, I can't change my course. Yes, you can. Call upon the Holy Spirit to change it for you. That's the answer. That's God's plan of salvation. And we can't create our own brothers and sisters. And that's why I like this picture. It was actually painted by a Mormon, but I don't care. It's still a good picture. I like this picture because I'm think, well, I'm looking at Aaron sitting there and wondering the total helplessness he must feel. He had just sank to the lowest low. He's cre helped them create a false God. And now he's going to be an intercessor for the one true living God. And he doesn't deserve the position. He only has it because God chose him. And brothers and sisters, none of us are any different. We're only here by God's grace. We only have the little titles and positions and the pro being, it's a privilege to be a part of salvation of the close of time. It, we're only here because God chose us, not because we're so smart, we're so great, we're so connected, we know so much. None of that means anything. It's only because he chose us. That should create a little gratitude, right? It certainly does for me, it motivates me. When I'm tired, I don't feel like doing it, I'm not into it. Me and Sister Hood ain't getting along. I'm mad at the kids. I kicked the dog. I, I swung at a beehive the other day and hit the house. I got to fix that, Mike. I need you to come over and fix it. <laughs> and I, I hit the side. Of, I was so mad. So I can't believe I did that. I didn't feel like ministering to anybody. But then I remember that no matter what Jesus went through, he still hung there and died for me. You've heard it. If I had been the only one, he still would have done it. So I find the energy from somewhere and give him the glory that's due to him. All right. So it looks like there are no more comments or questions on the ceiling, unless you were just waiting for me to shut up. But I can pause for a minute if you want to say something now before we go to the next step. Pastor, I find that that's so important for us to hear one more time, because we are people who are part of behavior modification. We are trained to change our behavior. We are trained that even in our training on our jobs and for any new position, you have all this training. And sometimes you don't even like it. You don't want to do it, but that, hey, you have to do it for that position, blah, blah, blah. So it's a behavior modification. But with the sanctification process, it's not behavior modification. It's an entire, complete recreation. Yes. God is creating something new in you. Yes. And to be able to say, Yes, I am unable to do it. I can't fake it till I make it anymore. Mm. And Lord, in your mercy, oh God, mm. change me. Yeah. Take over. Take, take the wheel before I crash this thing again, Lord. Again, Hallelujah. Right. Thank again. you. Go ahead, again. <laughs> <laughs> the PK word. I'm going to help you preach this thing tonight. Because it's, it's really the only thing God is trying to get us to get in a million different ways. And we still think, well, let me see what I can come up with. We don't need to come up with anything. All right? Oh, I didn't know you. Are you done, Elder? Because I was trying to get in there with you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, oh, okay. sir. All you right. know, look, don't start me to preaching on it because no, hallelujah, no. that's what I say, hallelujah, praise God to hear it again. No. That it makes it, it makes all the difference in the world because we've been, well, I, I'm not going to say we, I'm going to say I, 
-hmm. I have been struggling. Mm -hmm. But look here. Jesus knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I can can have the conviction. I can confess the thing and just submit. Let God have his way and he will bring the fruit. It's just, it's so simple. He keeps telling us the, mm -hmm. the branches stay connected to the vine and they will automatically bear fruit. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Look, we got to get in that chair. You know, it may be uh, it may cause some oohs and some ahs, and people may whisper, say, how in the world, why, why would he be in that chair as long as he's been in the chair? It don't matter. I can't be saved until I humble myself and sit in that same seat Aaron sat in. Or oh, it's, it's easier if nobody knows who you are, but hey, you already established that you're a believer, you're a worker, and all, but you still got to sit in that chair of humility and allow God to bless you. Amen. I'm going to preach with you, Elvis. I, I, I would like to say one more thing. Go ahead, Mike. The sisters, Sister Stone, uh, yeah. Sister Stone is correct. We, not mm -hmm. I, we, we all, we all do it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Good point, Mike. It's, it's, uh, with all the theology, with all the the continuing education and the times away and all that, I'm the pastor and I sit in the seat of the scornful sometime and God got to get me back on track. Mm -hmm. There's no, no uh, secret plan to get around this journey. That's right, Mike. It's a we. Okay. All right. We're going to go on. We're on page 80 now. Uh, again, we're dealing with uh, the latter rain and the time of trouble. We're just doing the introduction tonight, and then we're going to continue on next week. Page 80, paragraph 1. As we discussed in our previous chapter, Scripture calls the process of spiritual growth the sealing. Remember, we talked a lot about that. People were thinking that the sealing just happens at the end, right before you know, all Hades break loose on the earth. For us, it is a process that we're going through now. And there will be some who come in at the last minute, but we have no excuse as believers to try to get in at the last minute. That, that, that should be embarrassing when God has already touched our hearts and provided us so many opportunities to get on course. Okay, so we'll continue leading us to stand for right as disciples for the right reasons is how God intends to keep us from being shaken out. Whew. When trouble comes our way, it is important to understand this root fruit relationship between our faith and our actions. Isn't that the truth? We got to keep that right in our minds. Sometimes our actions can become so routine that we forget the source of our favor. If we don't, then we will never, boy, that's a strong word. We will never balance the law and the gospel in our experience. We will be more vulnerable to the devil's attempts to overthrow our faith. Isn't that the fight? Trying to balance the law, the law makes us feel naked. Remember I talked about Adam and Eve hiding? And Jesus coming, the law makes us feel helpless and hopeless sometimes. And we got to remember there's another side to that. It's supposed to send us running to Jesus and, and throwing ourselves at his mercy. And, and that's the difference between Cain and Abel. And so here is what I'm trying to prevent, right? This is a, a, a fight scene from a movie. And, but it takes place in church. And I saw it and I said, I wonder if this is what we look like from heaven's point of view. When we choose people that we just not gonna speak to, or we, we, we can't uh, enjoy a word from the Lord if it comes from certain people, Lord have mercy. Or, or we've decided that we have the few we like and no more or we participate in gossip or 
um, or, or, or strategizing to, to make power moves, to get the things that we want. Brothers and sisters, I am so tired of hearing that this is just how church is. I don't believe that. I don't believe that God has ever accepted this in church. I wonder if this is the way church looked when Jesus tied that whip together and ran the money changers out. You see, you probably won't see people going this far in church, but remember what Jesus said. Jesus said that you have heard that uh, you're not supposed to murder anybody. But I say, if you have hatred in your heart, you're guilty of murder. You've heard that you're not supposed to commit adultery, but I say, if you have lust in your heart, then you've already committed. You see, any thoughts about this? Do you think that, that it's possible to uproot these kinds of things out of church and create a true worship experience? Any, anybody brave enough to step out and speak on that? I'm gonna say um, in your dreams. No, I'm gonna say that um, <laughs> It is a good dream. It's a good prayer and it's a good wish. But um, scripture does say we're going to have trouble until he comes. I think all we can do is just not be that person that is the troublemaker. All right. I got a uh, comment as well. Deacon King man here. Yes. And this is so phenomenal. I just finished up with the viewing service for uh, Deacon Grady Lewis. Mm -hmm. And um, there were three individuals, three Europeans that came in to give their condolences and they belong to a group of like uh, individuals who have the symptoms and the, and the um, Agent Orange that is coming up in their body. And <clears throat> here you got three white guys coming in to the service of an African-American giving their condolences and they were moved because they said that Brother Grady was always positive and they just was tearful because of the passing on. It was like, why him? What I'm saying is, is yes, we can have a church where we are demonstrating God in our life because Grady was an example of this. It's so easy, and I keep saying, and I'm talking to myself to talk to talk, but we have to walk to walk because people are guarding and looking at what we're doing more so than what we are saying. They said, I've heard all the sermons, so show me one. Hmm. So this movie that you're <clears throat> picturing here, it, it, that's a movie. It's like, this would never happen into a church where there's a fight scene of this caliber. You might have some arguing and something hmm. like that, but not where one has got a gun or whatever hmm. with a weapon and shoot each other in the church. Yeah. But unless you got somebody who's invaded the church coming in, doing harm to the church members, then these are just modern weapons of the weapons of the past. So I'm moved by example of our own deacon and his passing, it looks good. And when you say we are asleep and we are all looking to get together for the second coming, Brother Grady was teaching by example. Yes. And yes. I'm just wow. wanting to just let everybody know that peace and love everyone and thank you. All right. Thank Can you I make a comment? Oh, uh, it's a phone call. Go, go ahead, and then Sister D, you go after her. Thank you. Okay, this is Sister Whitlock. As I'm looking at this picture, it reminded me of what I saw going on yesterday on the view when they were. Let me see. Not. I had turned to the view. And they were showing what went on in Congress on January 6th. To me, it was very similar to that. I realize this is a movie, but human, those human beings were not acting January 6th. And your question was, will the church, I think you're asking, if, is the church gonna ever be the church triumphant by itself? Yes. No. Yes. We had no, you have to let go and let God. Some people are gonna let go and let God. Other people are going to continue 
to be the way they want to be and control their own life until Jesus comes and separates the wheat from the tares. He tells us, don't do it. You don't know who the wheat is. You might have root the wrong person. No, it will not happen until the sealing, until before Jesus comes and the sealing, when people make it, when people make up their mind, I'm going to let go. I'm going to let God. I'm going to stop playing church. I think people are going to be pretending until Jesus comes. And that's why he says when he comes, I never knew you. Because these people that are playing church are going to be telling how much they did. He said, "You, I don't know you. You got to have a personal relationship with Christ. You got to know him. If he don't know you, it's because when he comes, it's because you didn't know him when you lived on this earth. You only pretended to do it. So no, the church that we know today will never be tried. Uh, mm. uh, 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 the church militant is not the church triumphant. And only then, and I heard the uh, him say, or will the races get together? The Bible says they come from every nation. When the Caucasians, when the Indians, when the Orientals see themselves as one under God, but otherwise we can't do it. We can pretend to like people of other races, but only when we see that we're all children of God and we all have that same spirit like they did in the upper room. God had to send that the, the, the latter rain. That's what I'm praying for and I hope we're all praying. God, we need that latter rain. We need you to touch us as you did the people in the upper room. Only then. But the church that we go to week by week the Sunday people go to week back. No, it's not going it, to. It, it, it's They're just like these people in the movie. They're just like the people on, on January 6th. Okay, now I, I hope I'm trying to make it clear. Uh, you've been clear. Sometimes I think people feel, well, we just try real hard. Then you can just love everybody. You can't. It said in these writings tonight, you can't even... You can't even think a good thought unless the Holy Spirit leads you. We need to let go and let God. And then I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I just want to inter interject one little thing here and give some clarity. Uh, my, my example is this is not physically what happens in church every week, but spiritually, is this the way it looks from heaven? Right, and I gave some examples of Jesus says, you heard that if you do, you're wrong, but I say, if you feel that way, you're wrong, right? Then the other thing is I want to ask just food for thought. Um, the name of the book is called Surviving the Shaking. It is God that allows the shaking and the shaking takes place because just as we had the beginning of the church in the New Testament, it was pure. The church that finishes the work is going to be pure, right? So I, I don't wanna give people, somebody probably about to say it, so I'm gonna stop here and let, go ahead, Sister D. Okay, I just wanna say that um, I believe this is symbolic, you mm -hmm. know, of course it's not little, symbolic of uh, what we don't see among members mm -hmm. there's a lot of silent fights going on and things that may linger for years and for years and all it is is a snare and a trap to keep us distracted mm -hmm. to keep us from moving forward from church uh, keep churches from growing from uh, helping in the community and you know god has told us if we are a part of the body of christ we all have a gift 
-hmm. There is something we all can do. But if I'm mad at the pastor and I don't like his wife, and I don't like what she said, and I don't understand why Deacon King, man, I don't like him. You know, all those things are just uh, tricks of the enemy to keep us from moving forward. And it does take the Holy Spirit to, to work on us as individuals to heal these things. You know, we take communion and everything, but before we even go to communion, we're supposed to hash out and fix these things mm -hmm. with our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. That's our job. God gave us the instructions, but it seemed like we get into situations and we, we, we take, we, we, we turn it back on God. God, it was your fault. It was your responsibility. God, why didn't you, you know, God let this happen. He has a will. He has a permissive will. He's not going to take us by the hand and force us to do anything. That's why we have the Bible to read. Our instructions have already been given to us. But I, I'm asking God to heal the hearts of our church members that if we have all with our brothers and sisters and others may not see it, th these silent fights that go on, that we will have courage enough to go to one another because when we don't do it, we are on the side of the enemy. We are not on the side of Christ. I don't care how you try to flip it and dress it up and happy Sabbath. It. You are clearly on the side of the enemy when you are not carrying out the will of God and going to your brothers and sisters and hashing out and healing the hurt. Mm. Mercy. Good, 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 good. Thank y'all. Sister Veronica. Yes, Pastor, I have to go down my phone because of my computer. I don't know what happened. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't hear what you guys were saying, but I think it can happen. It can happen because I think this problem is a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's a spiritual issue because Christ said, you know, it depends on your heart. If you're converted, Christ said, let this mind be in you. As Christian, we are trying to live in the spirit by the grace of God and trying to get, you know, get better each and every day. Um, it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We come to church every day and we're trying to walk the walk. But I think it's just a spiritual issue, depending on where they are in their Christian journey. Mm -hmm. And you know, if their hearts are converted, you know, because we are trying to get to heaven. We are coming, we are listening, we are trying to live in harmony. But pastor, these things happen back in the church, way back in um, when Paul, there was issue in the church and people weren't getting along. And Paul had to address the church and get rid of those problems. So I think it can happen. It's just that where we are in Christ and how much we're willing to sacrifice and kill the flesh and abide in Christ and stick to the vine. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother Mike. Yeah, I was going to say, if we go back to a couple uh, paragraphs or where it said uh, we cannot yeah, we cannot generate even a single spiritual thought unless Christ feeds us you know that that's the only time we're going to get the a good you know get all the hatred and the, you know the bitterness and everything we got to we got to go to that as yeah. the church yeah uh, I, what I hear uh, is I think that some of us don't factor in the shaking amongst God's people is very much biblical and very much in the spirit of prophecy that there will come a time where those who are not a part really giving their heart to the Lord will be shaken out of the church all right iPhone that is sister um uh I think that's sister Watts no, that's me, Pastor. I just want to oh, say listen, you came back. Okay. <laughs> Why? No, I, I'm on the phone. Yeah, I had to oh, get okay, off the ahead. laptop. So I was just want to say Christ called us to walk in righteousness and holiness. Mm -hmm. At some point in our journey, we should be attaining that, you know, and trying to reach that level. 
So all I'm saying is that it can happen if we have our, you know, priorities right and if we are converted. And as um, Sister Betty said, you know, the wheat and the tears is going to grow until the day of harvest. We have to just be true to God and just um, walk in the spirit. You know, um, Paul said also that, yeah, we fight every day. You know, the things that we're supposed to do, you know, we'll find ourselves not doing. And the things we're not supposed to do, we are doing. So it's a spiritual fight. It's a war in our flesh. And we have to keep our minds right on Christ. We have to be rooted and grounded. It's a fight for me every day. But I let the spirit, you know, I try by the grace of God, let the spirit, you know, do the work. And if you, if you rest in Christ and let God do the work, you can overcome. Christ overcame so we can be overcomers. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, can I just add one more thing? Mm -hmm. I read the book written by the same man who wrote after the shake, and I read the shaking. And yeah. it said the I purpose. Talk about that, Sister Whitlock. I don't want to talk about it because we're going to read it together. <laughs> oh, are you going to do the shaking? Yes, we're going to do oh, it. Oh, okay, good. Okay, I'll save it till the end. <laughs> we got to answer all these questions. That yeah, yeah, I was about to say blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I just had to keep you from telling it. We can talk about it offline, Sister Whitlock. We can talk about it on the phone if you like. Uh, but uh, I did not, I, I, it was a matter of prayer. And uh, I feel the Lord led me to do this one first. Uh, because if I would have done the shaking first or creeping compromise, it may have been too heavy for us. So we're easing our way into it because the truth of the matter is Christ is coming for a certain type of bride, right? He's not coming from a, for a bride who said, well, what could I do? You know, that's not the bride he's coming from, for. He's coming for a bride individually. We have some challenges, but our, our, our mandate as a church, as the bride of Christ should be without spot or wrinkle. And all of the issues there as a church it are differences of doctrine. And it's hard to see how important it is now because this is a time of peace. But when the time of trouble takes place, that's when God separates the wheat from the tear. See, people talk about that like he's going to do it in the graveyard. No, he's going to do it in the church right before he comes because he needs a church to finish the work. Just like he breathed on the church to start the work, he's going to breathe on the church to finish the work. And if we don't teach it right, we let folks off the hook. We have people just kind of hunching their shoulders and say, well, the church ain't going to never get right until Jesus comes. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the church at the end is going to have the same thrust of the Holy Spirit that it had in the beginning. That's what the Bible says. And when that thrust comes, if we're on the wrong side of it, we'll be shaken out of the church. We'll be exposed for not really being a true believer to begin with. This is why I do so much of this stuff because I don't want anybody on my watch to be lost. I'm trying to be a good under shepherd and let Christ lead us to the conversations we should be having. Now I could get on here on Sabbath, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and I can just tickle your fancy and entertain you. I could, but I'd rather you be saved. All right, that was a good one. I think we're running out of time here for tonight. But we're going to continue with this conversation. It's, it's, and please, none of this is a threat or finger wagging. It's a plea to allow God to do what he promised. That's all. Page 80, paragraph 2. The Bible also illustrates our spiritual growth by what happens in the plant kingdom. It speaks of human beings as wheat and tares and compares the planting of spiritual truths where? In the heart to the sowing of seeds. Jesus stated that our spiritual growth was a gradual process 
just as a grain plant first develops a stalk, then the head, and finally matures seed. Mark 4, verse 28. The Apostle Paul also employed agrarian metaphors as he sought to teach his converse truths about Christian growth. He talked to the Ephesians about being rooted and grounded in what? Love. See that? See how there's little pictures and stuff I'm putting up coming together? Ephesians 3.17. This concept of the root is key to understand all other truths about what it means to be a Christian. Hallelujah. Jesus is the root that brings life-giving energy to us. Isaiah said he would be to us as a root out of dry ground. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 53, 2. In other words, just as the root is the support system for the plant, so reliance on the merits, oh, this is so important, on the merits of Jesus's righteousness nourishes our spiritual life. You see, the opponents of Christianity says, your God is vain because he wants all the worship. But let me present that a different way. If God, the Father, makes Jesus the object of our affection, then it becomes impossible for us to become puffed up in vain and depend upon ourselves. Instead, we depend upon his grace toward us. So as Paul says, no man can boast about what he did or didn't do. We all owe it all to Christ. And so now I got to treat you right because I'm just a beggar just like you. I can't do the man-made fleshly thing where I decide who's important and who's not. None of us had the power to save ourselves. And if we go into it like that, it'll be just like Acts chapter four, where they had to stop the people from giving when they realized what Christ had done for them, where they were coming by the thousands every day because they realized what Christ had done for them, the rich, the poor, the beggar, the sick, the healthy, they all got along fine because they realized they brought nothing to the table but their surrender. This is what will be required to finish the work. Only this will make the world take notice that Jesus is coming when, he see, when they see a church that's really a church. And I want to be in it. I, I'm not going to look at it like, well, I wish that it will happen, but I don't expect it. No, I want to be ready when the trumpet is blown and the call goes out. I want to be found faithful. And I want that for you too. When the rain falls, so far, the just and the unjust have experienced similar blessings. The crops have yielded the fruit, whether it's for a good person or a bad person. Uh, a heathen has tithed, been able to tithe and, and, and reap the benefits of tithing. I know several heathens who are faithful tithers and they don't do anything else church related, but their, their businesses have been blessed because they follow a biblical principle. But there is a greater test coming where money won't matter, that's James chapter five, where, where money will be thrown into the streets, where politics won't matter because the kings of the earth won't be able to stop what's coming. When the uh, antichrist is revealed, when all of those things take place, when all of those things go down, the only thing that's going to be able to cover us is where we stand in Christ. That's what we're preparing for, all right? And so, but when that latter rain falls, most people won't even know what's happening, but the faithful will be renewed, refreshed and empowered to finish the work. And I wanna tell you brothers and sisters, when you start going down prophecy trail, ain't much left. You know, people want to say, well, you know, we got time because this need to happen and that need, it ain't much left to happen. 
So, so if you've been waiting for a time to, to gear up and get it together, this is the time. Today is the day. All right, we got to finish this. Uh, okay. Uh, deep roots not only provide the tree with the food elements necessary for survival, they also give it stability during storms. Oh, look at the man preaching. When heavy winds blow, trees with shallow roots are the ones most likely to get uprooted. Similarly, our roots of faith must grow deep into the religion uh, of Christ in order to stand during the shaking. This happens as we experience more fully the truth of justification by faith. We never stop talking about that. Now I know that there are other religious systems out there that believe that we'll be raptured away and we won't experience any of this. None of that is biblical. God's word says he gives us the strength to endure trouble. He doesn't pull us out of trouble. We are his representatives on earth. How will the people hear without a word? And you can't get a word without a preacher. How can the three angels message go out if we are not present? So we need to be ready for that. Only God knows if any of us living today will be a part of it, but why would you take the chance? It's almost like some of us are hoping that we'll be asleep before then. No, those people who are alive when he comes uh, have a special blessing put upon their life. They have a special place in the kingdom of God because they will face the enemy and stand by the grace of God. Proverbs 12, 3 says, the root of the religious shall not be moved. Hallelujah. The foliage of our visible commitment may often wither our fruit ourselves at times appear to be dying on the vine. We may even find ourselves bent to the ground by the trials of life that blow our way. But the Bible says, y'all better go on depend on the Bible. Don't you listen to Pastor Hood? Don't you listen to nobody else? The Bible says that nothing will uproot us. We don't have to worry about the tears because they're going to remove themselves. I want to be the wheat. I want to be firmly planted to where all these sermons and all these Bible studies and all these prayers and all these church meetings will pay off because they have deeply rooted me in, the tr in, in trusting God. And I know that that's what you want to. If through justification, we remain tapped into the eternal life-giving root, Jesus Christ, then we can outweather anything that comes our way, even death. As Martin Luther wrote in his hymn, a mighty fortress, the body they may kill, God's truth, justification in Christ, abideth still. Yes, though we may go dormant in death, if we have died in the faith, our root is still alive. We will resurrect in the spring of the eternal morning. A plant without a solid root system will naturally, a plant with a solid root system will naturally bear the fruit its planter intended. Uh, that's a deep one right there. Likewise, the Christian rooted in the justifying merits of Jesus Christ will eventually bear the fruit that God intends. Just like the, the uh, law is a test that shows us where we are, we don't have to wait to the end and be surprised. Also, whether or not we bear fruit shows us where we are. So we don't have to go into the test not knowing. We know right now the, the, how we stand against the law and we also know how we impact the lives of others. If it's not where it's supposed to be, then we need to fall on the rock, Christ Jesus. Proverbs 12, 12 says that the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. Yes, indeed. I think this might be the last one here. Jesus said, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. 
for the tree is known by uh -huh, his fruit, Matthew 12, 33. He is, of course, speaking of the fruits of the spirit that appear in a person's life as they become more and more acquainted with the salvation of Christ. See Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Yes, indeed. Any comments before we close? Any questions or comments before we close tonight? Can you tell us a little bit of how we know, how we can recognize the fruit in our lives? Well, uh, in the coming pages, we're going to discuss that thoroughly. I, I would like to, uh, but it's going to start a whole nother lesson. <laughs> right. I, I, I'll just say briefly here that um, just as this picture, I've used this picture in my um, in my my personal memoirs about my life, uh, because in the end, Sister Donna, we can manage our uh, reputation with others, but it's raw and real between us and God. We know whether or not we're seeking to please Him, or whether or not we're masquerading as someone who does. And um, when we are actually surrendering to God, then the Holy Spirit draws people to us and they have a pleasant experience overall. Uh, they they uh, want to know more. Uh, they, they tend to wanna hang around you and follow you and do what you do. Um, there's a sweetness to it because the pride gets killed and the arrogance goes away and the humility that is offensive to worldly people is sweet to those who are seeking God. And so um, there are gonna be people that God trusts you with because you are trusting him. That, uh, I guess that's a short version of it, but, uh, but that is an excellent question and we're gonna get in deep into it because we need to get real about these things. Any, any other thoughts or comments before we close out? This is Sister Woodlock. I'm just going to say thank you for the word you just said. I, I, I think they're so beneficial. Uh, uh, you, to me, you said it, made it plain that you will know. That's all I'll I'll just say you will know. Job knew, Paul know, you will know. Mm -hmm. Okay. You'll know when you're walking with Christ. And you when you let go and let God, you will know it. I'll just say this right quick. Sabbath, I wasn't gonna come. I, I really didn't feel like coming to church. And when I I had some thoughts in my mind, but when I came there, what Pastor Brown. Is that his last name? Yes. What he said was just what I needed. And yeah. I had been thinking, you know, my situation was a lot like him. You know, he told, and I'm saying this because he said it. He told about his mother dying when he was 15, but his is different. His father killed his mother. And as he was talking, I'm thinking about my mother and my father and things coming up. And I said, Lord, I'm so glad you sent them. When you are trying to get close to the Lord and you need something, he'll send somebody in there that'll give you just what you need. Now, I don't know if anybody understood what I said, but anyway. Oh, yes. All I I'm saying is he knew what I needed and he gave it to me. I wasn't even coming. But anyway, you'll know okay because when he answers so many prayers and i wasn't here I, I mean when they was talking about things the the cousin that i told you was in four stage uh cancer her mm -hmm. sister-in-law came to take care of her today she called me my daughter who has cancer says mom they don't understand me at church or at work she says, I have a peace that passes understanding. 
I know what my daughter's going to. I thank God what he did for my daughter. Well, anyway, I'll just leave it alone. When daily, 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 when I get down, I see him lifting me up. I know in whom I have believed. I'm going to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good word, Sister Whitlock, and I appreciate it. Uh, uh, there, the people are saying amen. You probably didn't see them typing, but they understood exactly what you're saying. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is the it is the shaky ground that keeps us offended with one another. You know, when we don't have our hand in the Lord's hands, and we create our own path to salvation. You know. I remember the old preachers used to say, you're running and ain't nobody chasing you. <laughs> you know, you, you're giving an explanation and nobody asked what you were doing. Uh, this is what brings offenses because there's only one way to be saved. And that is to allow God to take the wheel. And that's what the plea is for tonight. I, as I said earlier, it's not finger wagging. It's not throwing stones, it's saying, church, ain't nothing left to happen but the final call and for the sky to crack. And see, if, you, if you're trying to do it by the newspaper, if you're trying to wait and see if the Antichrist is going to come from the east, if the alien's going to come, if the shot's going to make you glow, if the virus is going to come back, that's the wrong way to look at it. All right? The, the way that we look at things is um, first of all, am I ready? And second of all, are governments openly defying God? Right? And the answer to that is yes. Right? Uh, God, Jesus gave us a couple of examples. He gave us Sodom and Gomorrah, he gave us the time of Noah. And those things have some very similar things in common trying to change the nature of what God created men, women, boys, and girls to be and how we relate to one another. And I'm telling you, if you're waiting, if you're waiting for somebody to get a new Pope or to, to announce that I'm the devil, I'm here, you just might not have enough oil in your lamp. Okay, so, so my thing is y'all, I'm getting ready to close. But if we're gonna do church, let's do church. Let's not play with it. If we're gonna do it, let's go ahead and do it. If we're not, then why are we here? All we're doing is deceiving ourselves. So, but it begins with, you know, asking God to take charge. All right, anything else before we shut it down for tonight? I wanted to give this uh, example of when you go in someone's home or as like using our church as the home and you come in and you see a fruit bowl and mm -hmm. you look over there and they got real fruit mixed in with artificial fruit <laughs> and you reach up and say, well, I want this apple. It's looking mighty good. And you grab it and you actually feel it in your hand. It feels real. But when you bite it, you realize that it's artificial. So mm -hmm. that's what we are as far as the fruit. We're the church. And when we say taste and see that the Lord is good, do we see teeth print on us or is there not that evidence that we are artificial? Because after biting that fruit, you look at it, you see evidence of teeth marks where somebody else was fooled too. Mm. So we, can, we can fake it until we make it if we think we can, but that's not how it's going to work. Our teeth prints that's left on us rather than the fruit that we have going around us will be the evidence of our realness. Amen. 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 Great example. Appreciate that. Well, I've kept y'all past 830. I want you to come back next week. So I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. Uh, remember, again, uh, I tell you, we have several families grieving. If you know them, uh, drop them a line, send them a text, give them a call and encourage them. Uh, we will be again at the church in the morning to um, say goodbye to Brother Grady. And I hope to see uh, some of you there. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for um, getting our attention tonight. All of us have a heart check to do. And I'm reminded now of that song, All to Jesus I Surrender. All to him I freely 
give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. Lord, that is our prayer. That's our desire. Uh, Sister Veronica rightly brought up tonight, Romans chapter seven, the good that I would, I do not. And that which I uh, don't want to do, I find myself doing. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we're so thankful that you sympathize with us, but you also promise us the power to grow in Christ and to overcome. And so Lord, we're calling on that promise tonight as individuals and as a church, teach us Lord, how to love one another like you first loved us. Take away that insecurity, worrying about judgment and Lord, give us a heart that says, Lord, I will do whatever you ask because I wanna be with you forever. Forgive us Lord, where we have fallen short Lord, help those who have seen bad examples and been affected by it. We pray that you reach them as well. We ask, Lord, tonight that you be with us and that you be with the grieving families, all three of them uh, that are from our church family and comfort them. And then, Lord, give us a good night's rest as we come together again in the morning and on Friday night. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you all so much.